Well, it's nice to be here. I had two hours of sleep on a 36-hour travel arrangement, and, but I've slept really well the last couple days, so uh, I'm ready and raring to go. Lunch is settling in pretty well for you all right now? <laughs> Siesta time? I'm going to move through pretty quickly on a lot of slides, so hopefully I'll keep your interest up, keep the number of words on the slides down the best I could, and um, minimize the amount of math that we'll go through, so hopefully uh, this will be pretty entertaining. I want to start with a definition of life uh, because it's, it's pertinent to what I'm talking about in terms of geometry, and I think that you'll come to appreciate that as we move along. <clears throat> in school, we probably all uh, were told that the good definition of life has to do with metabolism and reproduction and uh, the power of adaptation to the environment as a result of internal uh, activities within the, within the organism. But I would propose that a better definition of life is a, is a simpler one, that life is communication with intent. So any communication that occurs within the universe, if there's an intent behind it, that is not only an indicator of life, that is life. If we are not communicating with anything, there's no sense in us being here. So the question then is, how, within how broad of a context do we find intent uh, as an indicator of life uh, in this universe? Therefore, based on that, uh, on that definition of life, cosmic consciousness or Christ consciousness, so forth, has an intent because there's a communication going on between us. So my thesis today is that cosmic consciousness provides symbols for comprehending and communicating relationships between each other, that's between you and me, everyone else in this room, us and the earth, us and the cosmos, and us and the creator, however we envision that creator to be. And that goes for all cultures throughout time and around the world as well. That this is a common thread that binds the fabric of humankind across time and space for perhaps um, millions of years, as we'll see. And the concept of the sacred is communicated in the form of circular geometrical symbolism. And that that symbolism is continuity of uh, cross cultures and it is specific to a particular type of, of geometry. Although that geometry in each culture is temporal and it changes over time and, over, and across space. But ultimately, these, each of these circular symbols is a 2D facet of a very specific three-dimensional geometry, which you can guess is going to be spherical. So this is, a common, uh, this is all common within the framework of all ancient and indigenous cultures, and it's represented in various traditions, including the arts, architecture, mythology, ritual, and ceremony. You can see these geometrical implications, these understandings of sacred concepts within these uh, various arts and sciences. Ultimately, one of the most important points I want to leave you with is that the circle is a proxy for the sphere. So when we talk about uh, stone circles, I believe that every stone circle is actually representing a spherical structure. And that seems to be the case from a geometrical standpoint, as I'll, as I'll show you. So for example, when we look at these ley lines, or the, the avenue between uh, Avebury and the sanctuary, rather than that being a roadway, I would tend to think of it more of a, of a tube of energy that's flowing between these sites, not one that's just level at our eye level or where we sense it. There's a, a tube of some diameter, and I would propose that some investigation be done along those lines to take a look at the three-dimensionality of these, of these avenues, for example. The fundamental geology, uh, geometry uh, with regard to the sphere consists of nine great circles with a specific spatial relationship that I will show you. This is important because it comes up virtually every time when I look at uh, uh, circular sacred symbols. And the symbol, a spherical symbol, is, is representing universal sacred concepts. Every culture throughout time around the world assigns the circle as representing these types of communication relationships that I spoke of before. Uh, it, that is, uh, we find that in every culture. And it's been expressed over thousands, and as I said before, perhaps millions of years. Finally, the other imp real important uh, comment to make is that 
this all concerns the nature of the universe and our place within it. That's what these symbols are trying to rel relate to us, that these relationships between us and the earth and the cosmos and creator are the most sacred relationships that there are. They are fundamental. They are um, important to all of us. They have been always important to us. They will continue to be important to all of us. And that's what life is all about, communication between these, these various entities, okay? So here we have uh, a number of objects from about 1.5 million years ago from Africa, Old of I Gorge, if you're familiar with that. A number of these are hammer stones with a spherical form being uh, created as a result of smashing other rocks to create implements, tools, and so forth. Other than that, there are these diamond shapes on the lower part of the, of the screen. And these shapes come up time and time and time again. Specifically why, we don't know. But it's curious that in the upper right-hand portion of the screen, we have a stone that chips have been uh, taking off of it, and they've created this diamond shape on there. And yet of even more interest, the large stone in the lower right appears to have three large chips taken out of it. And this stone was found with a, within a context where these types of pebbles, this lithology, if it was a granite or a sandstone, whatever this stone was, is not common to this location where it was found. In other words, it had to be transported in. The suggestion being that this stone has no utilitarian value. It's, it's not a hammer stone. It probably wasn't meant to be created this way. But whoever picked it up and carried it, carried it because it had some intrinsic value to it. The geometry may very well be that intrinsic value, that the, something was recognized of value in this stone, even though it couldn't be used for anything by um, this proto-human uh, 1.5 million years ago. So there's something going on with the geometry even at that time, that there was a, a continued creation of certain geometrical forms that were recognized as being important. When this began, no one knows. You may be familiar with these types of structures in South Africa. Tens and tens of thousands of them. This is just one. And you'll see that even at going back that far, we have circular structures made of dry stack stone. They're in poor condition, but you can still recognize the circular nature of these structures. So there's an exterior wall, roughly circular. And even within the interior of it, we have a circular rooms. And there's something of importance, something of value, something that is needed in terms of these structures that they had to be around. Gobekli Tepe, here we have three of the temples. And obviously they are round, uh, very similar. There's something going on that there's, the circularity is important in these structures, again, being temples. So I would propose that the same reasoning is going behind the construction of these round temples in each of these, each of these cases, even though these are now dating rather than 70,000 or plus years ago. Now here we're looking at 9, 10, 11,000 years ago, something like that. But still the architecture is still the same with the dry stack uh, stone walls. Other than that, the, the rectangles are T-shaped uh, pillars or columns. And it's interesting to note that Within them, each of them have two pillars that are oriented in a northeast, southwest direction for some particular reason. But otherwise, we've got this circularity going on. And here, are, here is a temple in Malta, or a series of three temples. I can't, every time I look at this, on the left, the large one is a, is a monkey face. And he's got his wife next to him, the other big one. And on the bottom right is their son or daughter. So it's a family affair of, of temples here. But we have a circularity going on, and the rooms on the interior are circular, just like the ones in South Africa. So these, again, are temples. So we're starting to see that throughout time, sacred structures, temple structures, where there's a communication and a bonding going on between the human being and, and the environment, the circle seems to be playing an importance. And here is a, a medicine wheel uh, Native American. It's in East Central South Dakota on the Great Plains. And it is roughly 16 um, feet
feet in diameter, some, something like that. But again, we see the circle. We have some lines coming through it to a central cairn, which has been destroyed by uh, some Euro-American looking for something in the middle of the cairn of value, and it's been left like that. But this structure remains in place on the grasslands. Um, I trespassed to go take a look at it. And, um, it's a very important site, and I'll discuss that in a little bit uh, as to why it's very important. I put this slide up in case you're ever in, in Winnipeg, Canada, and you'd like to visit the Bighorn Mountains in the United States. Because here are the Bighorn Mountains, and the, the, the high mount in the background is Cloud Peak. That's the highest peak in the Bighorn Mountains. This is in Wyoming. And Cloud Peak attains an elevation about 13,400 feet. And in front of it, um, oops, back and pointer. Back, there we go, and pointer. This valley here, the bottom of the valley is about 10 to 11,000 feet. And at about this point here, if you went straight down into the bottom of the valley, you'd see this guy, which I happened to have a chance encounter with back in 2003. Just happened to, to come upon it after, after dinner. And this is a medicine wheel that is, is perfect in form. It is 83 inches in diameter, no matter where you measure across on the inside of the, of the circular uh, circle of stones. 83 inches in diameter. Someone was very careful putting this together. And you can see across here and across here. And then there's actually two additional diameters. See these stones here? They kind of line up and come across there. And then there's another one that's coming back in through, right through here. They're hard to pick out, but, but it's, it's a very well constructed. Someone was really paying attention when they put this together. And I was curious about the, the geometry of, of this structure. Why that geometry? What does it represent? What's the symbolism going on here? Who constructed it? Why did they build it where they did? This is over 10,500 feet. They took the picture in August. Uh, it's at such a high ele elevation that it's only uh, accessible two months out of the year, otherwise the snow is covering it. So very strange that they would be put there. And here's the line drawing of what I call then Cloud Peak Medicine Wheel. And you can see how perfect of a form it has. And it has a central cairn in the middle that rises up maybe 12 to 15 inches. And uh, another line diagram showing how Isla was constructed. Even though it's deep in a valley and you can't see any stars directly to the north, uh, the, the north line that was constructed is within 10 degrees of north, and the east-west one is amazingly within three degrees of, of where it should be. So. Uh, where I'm going with this is what I discovered reading the mythologies and trying to understand what this medicine wheel was all about is this is the extent of what historians have believed in general was the extent of the Lakota nation's territory, the Lakota being Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull and, and uh, the Custer Battlefield and all, all that. So this is what was generally believed to be the extent of their territory. My studies have shown that the territory runs along the Bighorn River to the Yellowstone River, Missouri River, and along the Niobrara River and back to a point in dry land where you just go over uh, a little hump and you're back into the Big River, uh, Bighorn River drainage. So this is basically uh, the area that the Lakota considered their, their territory that they operated in where they reaped the resources and, and uh, enjoyed their lifestyle for at least several hundred years. The center is Bear Butte. Bear Butte is considered the center of the Lakota world. Cloud Peak is where I found this medicine wheel. There's another medicine wheel that I showed you, the one that's about 16 feet in diameter. That's the Jennings site in East Central South Dakota. Down here is Scott's Bluff, which is a, like a teepee-shaped natural rock formation. And up here are the Killdeer Mountains. And on one point on the mountains, these are low mountains, there is uh, what is referred to as a medicine hole. And the Cheyenne people believe that they came onto this current world out of Medicine Hole, so it's a very sacred site up here. Now, as you can guess, there's something going on here. This line between Cloud Peak Medicine Wheel through Bear Butte and it to the Jennings site is a line that is 550 miles in length 
and from the Cloud Peak to the Jennings site through Bear Butte is a straight line east-west within a few minutes of arc. A few minutes of arc, 550 miles. This is prehistoric, a prehistoric line of these two medicine wheels going through the center of the Lakota world. North-south, uh, Scotts Bluff and the Kild Kildeer Mountains up here. So you can imagine what was on these people's minds prehistorically. They actually constructed a sacred hoop, um, the uh, sun circle, the earth circle, many cultures have used this particular symbol. They constructed this 550 miles in diameter. And I, so I found the evidence, put the pieces together, realized this is what they had done. I was over on Pine Ridge and Rosebud uh, reservations last week, and I was told that it's very possible that as this was being constructed, every four days, whichever people were creating this circle on the ground surface, every four days they would construct another medicine wheel. So this is the largest sacred symbol on Earth. This is the largest structure ever constructed on Earth, to the best of my knowledge. And I believe that, that this is the greatest feat of engineering in North America. Not the World Trade Center, former World Trade Center, Empire State Building. These people prehistorically laid out this line virtually perfect with no, no measurement other than how far they could walk in a day or ride a horse in a day. And time was measured by the year, month, day and night, and yet they laid this out perfectly. So um, this is important for you, me, and everyone. This is the greatest structure, largest structure from a sacred standpoint that's been constructed on Earth. So here we have the, the symbol that we're all familiar with, and of course smack dab right in the middle is this cairn that was on this medicine wheel that I encountered. The, what I realized, thinking about the meaning of this symbol is this cairn sticking out of, the, out of the screen would have its double pointing into the screen. That created a, the third dimension. And what was being indicated by the medicine wheel that I saw is that this isn't a circular structure, but it's very easy to build a circle on, on Earth's surface, right? Just put your stones around in a circle. But how are you going to construct a sphere? So you start with one rock there and you start building your rocks up. That's very difficult to do, right? but you can build a circle to represent a sphere, and that's what this center means. That's the center where that's where one person is, and they see the circular surface, the horizon about them, and everything is connected in within me, and I am connected to everything, that type of thing. And so, uh, but there's also the above and below. So this is actually meant to be a, a sphere, is what I uh, rose rapidly concluding on that as the explanation for the geometry. And so here we're back at the Jennings site, and you can see that geometry. We just twisted things about 45 degrees, but it is, a, it is the same type of structure. Here's a Cloud Peak Medicine Wheel and the line drawing of the wheel. Down here is a symbol um, from the Mayans representing mother and father and the universe and everything uh, related, all coming to the center here. So this is the universe, this is the world. And you can see this structure within that. And you can see the same thing over here. So the same concept is going on here. The Mayans are talking about the center of their universe and how they interact in a sacred manner with it. Same thing with the Lakota over here, same geometry. Based on all this, what I've realized is the geometry shown down here, if you would create curves from all of these straight lines, you end up with something like this. And if that center has the projection in and out of the screen, you now instead of have a, a circle with a bunch of curves and straight lines, it's now spherical. And if all these lines are related to a sphere, since they're all passing through the center, what we have are nine great circles that form this particular geometry. So there's one, two, three, and then four, five, six, seven. And then these, these football shapes or, uh, or uh, rugby sh ball shapes are, there's two of them. So that this line is coming out of the, 
out of the uh, screen, this one's going in, so it's at a 45 degree angle, but it's really a circle. And then up here, we can go into the screen and come back out this way. So this is representing two circles, this is representing two circles, so we end up with a total of nine circles. And a three-dimensional view of the same thing. So here we have the spherical geometry and its polygonal uh, mate. And uh, each is constructed of either curvilinear or a, a planar surface triangles, 48 triangles, um, all of the same dimension. And so this becomes the fundamental geometry of what I was finding for these Native American medicine wheels. And the formal name for this polygonal structure is a dystiacus dodecahedron. I'm sure you're all familiar with the dodecahedron of 12 pentagons that form kind of a subspherical structure. This is a dystiacus dodecahedron. And again, composed of, uh, in this case, now instead of nine great circles, it's, and there are nine um, octagons, eight-sided pieces. So. And here is um, another view of the uh, the dystiacus dodecahedron. Real quickly, the geometry, it has 48 faces, scalene triangles, there's 72 edges, nine octagons times eight sides is 72 edges. It has 26 vertices where the edges are intersecting each other. And it is, consists, it creates a full octahedral symmetry and a cubic uh, crystal type of structure. So there are hundreds and hundreds of natural mineral crystals that are associated with this particular geometry. It's one of the highest degrees of symmetry that there is. And it's very close to being essentially spherical, representing the sphere. And it's one of the most common and fundamental geometries in crystals and minerals, uh, and I'll, I'll note one of them quickly. But here you can see on the bottom the hexagon and the cube, so we've got all types of more simpler geometries that are showing up in this particular structure. If we look at the triangular sides of the, uh, the uh, dodecahedron, they are approximately uh, showing a ratio of three to four to five. That's approximate. But when we look at the spherical form, these triangles form a two, three, four perfect relationship. And by using those values, we end up with a, di with a circumference of 24, which is interesting, thinking about uh, the 24 hours in the day. So up on top, we have the, uh, what I call the dystiacus dodecasphere. Uh, because now I've, I've rounded all the edges off, so we've got a spherical form. And as it turns out, uh, it, this blew me away. I started looking at sacred, circular symbols from many, many cultures. There's hundreds and hundreds of them, and there here are just a few. But every one of the geometry is associated. There's that one that keeps coming up, and here's the basic circle. But every one of these, all fit in some facet this structure two dimensions, and as circular structures in three dimensions as a spherical form, they are two-dimensional facets of this. And I have yet to find a cultural, circular, sacred symbol where this does not occur. Now, where did these symbols come from? They're coming from shamans, they're coming from priests and priestesses who are popping mushrooms or drinking something and coming back to the village and telling you sacred relationships are very important and we're going to symbolize it by these circular forms and then however they want to add in, uh, into this uh, per the specific culture. But every one is related to this one particular form. Why is that? It never varies. There's always a direct relation between these. And here are some more, even when we just have crosses, uh, they still fit the model. And oftentimes the crosses are going to have a circle associated with them. The Christian cross is just a cross, but there are you know, modifications to that with the Cairo and so forth. So even these are all fitting the model with the dystiacus dodecasphere. So because of that, because of all these sacred uh, circular symbols uh, relating to this structure, I call this the sacred sphere the dystiacus dodecasphere. A particular 
uh, element that's important is carbon in the form of diamond. It yields this very, this very same structure in the cube, and that's represented again in this polygonal form. And here we're putting pieces of, of the carbon molecule together to form diamond. Well, of course, carbon is important to all of us because we're made of carbon. We're carbon-based units as uh, the rest of the life on, on Earth is. So suddenly there's a connection here between humanity and biology and chemistry and the physical nature of the universe and geometry. And it keeps coming up time and time again related to this geometry. So again, the dodecahedron, polyhedron with uh, 12 sides, each side is a pentagon. If we take each pentagon and we take a diamond shape, divide it into four, so we have four triangles for each pentagon. Instead of 12 pentagons, we now have 48 triangles. So that's why this is a dodecahedron, the distiacus indicating that we now have uh, a four, uh, four triangles creating a diamond form and each of those is representing the, the, the polyhedron the, uh, pentagon. So that's where we get a distiacus dodecahedron from. So let's look at a number of sacred symbols that are related to the distiacus dodecasphere or sacred sphere. Obviously the circle is the, is the simplest one. But we can have two circles and we can consider the two circles when they touch at a point to be a lemniscate or a figure eight which we're all familiar with, and this, this geometry uh, fits into the model for the distiacus dodecasphere, as does the vesica pisces, which has its own unique geometry of interest, but since the vesica pisces fits into this model for the geometry of the, the sacred sphere, these values, this geometry is important to the, to the sacred sphere as well. Three circles are the triquatera, or three-cornered uh, tripod of life, four circles or four interlocked circles. We start looking at the cube and we start getting, or the square. And so that's important as is the hexagon that I mentioned before. And because the hexagon is important, the seed of life fits directly into, into the sacred sphere. And therefore as does the fruit of life and the flower of life. The flower of life is a two dimensional representation in three dimensions the sacred sphere geometry. So each of these two dimensional structures fits perfectly into that structure of nine great circles. And in fact, the tree of life does fit, with, fit the flower of life with these intersections in the circles, which is interesting to note. And obviously it fits into these uh, uh, hexagonal structures as well perfectly. And on the right you can see the Star of David and it's fitting in there nicely. On the, on the, uh, you can pick either one of them, but when you start looking at Hindu symbolism, um, you can see a correlation coming up here for, for that part of the world culturally. Uh, Wiedner and Bridges noted this figure, the Tree of Life within four interlocked circles. And they also suggest, suggested through the Bahir that there's a reflection of the, of the tree of life four times on a spherical multiverse. So it seems to fit this spherical form if you just rotate it a little bit and create four of these. So what about the sacred sphere and, and trying to fit the tree of life on, you know, is this fitting, fitting the model? Well, in fact, it does perfectly one time around the circumference of the sacred sphere. And nowhere will you find information on the tree of life related to Kabbalah having a three-dimensional spherical nature to it. But it appears that it may have been derived somehow from the sacred sphere geometry and creating two-dimensionality with it with these lines drawing in between, which sometimes you, is suggested a three, third dimension, but there's no spherical nature associated with this. And then one day I thought, well, if everything else is fitting, what about the tree of life? And, and sure enough, you start at the bottom here and work your way up and back around the backside. And so this point would be Malkut, and up here is Keter. So that's, I couldn't believe what I was seeing when I tried that one. 
The five platonic solids are all facets, three-dimensional facets of the sacred sphere geometry. While each of the uh, platonic solids can't be created from the geometry of one of the others necessarily, all five of them can be derived from the sacred sphere geometry, as can Buckminster Fuller's spherical um, VE or vector equilibrium structure. So suddenly, sacred geometries, uh, important uh, structures related to energies are all coming back to the fundamental structure of this guy here and in spherical form. Looking at the Chumash tribe in California, here is a, a, a drawing based on some cave paintings. And if you look closely at it, what's the geometry here and here and here and here and here? And even these guys, if you plot out these points, you start, start to find the a tree of life, Kabbalah, tree of life in here. So the geometry is the same, even though the symbols look a little bit different, the geometry is the same. And these are all representing spheres, sun spheres and, or what have you, but the geometry is what's important here because these are all sacred symbols related to the same geometry that I'm talking about. And they all represent unity and the universe and, and the connection of these uh, sacred relationships. So back to the Lakota on the left, we have um, the uh, sacred hoop and the buffalo that was important to the Lakota for their lifestyle. And again, the, the sacred hoop across the Great Plains as representing the universe, the world, a sphere represented by this particular geometry. All sacred circular symbols used by virtually every ancient and indigenous culture are two-dimensional representations of the three-dimensional geometry of the sacred sphere. And that's quite a statement. I have yet to find a circular structure, including stone circles, um, even the Great Pyramid, you may be aware, is designed numerically based on its height and breadth and so forth to be representing a hemisphere. So now we start looking at monumental megalithic structures and we find that what's being, what we're being told here in these uh, eternal structures is a spherical form, that that's important. So in, uh, in November of 2011, a white man, who I won't name, was on uh, Rosebud Reservation and he, he mentioned to a Lakota elder, he said, all circular sacred symbols represent spheres. And he said, we've been telling people this for 500 years. No one's listening. No one's been listening to this. Uh, an ethnographer by the name of Joe Brown uh, is the one who documented all of Black Elk's um, discussions about mythologies and, and Black Elk's visions, if you're familiar with those books. And the bringing of the sacred pipe uh, by white, calf, white buffalo calf woman to the Lakota is an, is an important myth but the Lakota will tell you that their myths are true history, okay? With that uh, sacred pipe, she also brought a stone, a round stone with seven circles on it. And this is Joseph Brown's interpretation of that. So he drew a round stone and he put seven circles on it, which based on my experience with the Lakota, this doesn't look lo Lakota at all. It looks like a white guy drawing a round stone with seven circles on it. So what's going on here? Well, Crazy Horse, his father's name was Crazy Horse, but when Crazy Horse was born, uh, his father said, I'm, I'm really nothing more than a worm. And so from there on on, he was known as Worm. And his, fa and his son uh, had the name Crazy Horse. But Worm told Crazy Horse, when Crazy Horse was a boy, that the, the ancestors knew that there were seven circles on the round stone, and this is a round red stone, and it, it's meant to represent the earth. Seven, seven circles on it, but at, at some time in the future, there would be two more circles, but he didn't know what that meant. Later on, Crazy Horse had a vision on Bear Butte, the center of the Lakota world, and he was crying for a vision, and this is literally crying, pleading, and talking to Tonkashia, the great grandfather, and wanting to know what these other two circles were. I know what these first seven are because they're related to the Lakota rites, but what are these two that are yet to come? And suddenly, 
from, a, from the horizon, he saw an, uh, a nine-pointed star, and he recognized that this was the star of his people, and that someday, even though they were battling with the white man, someday the Lakota nation would return and be as powerful as it once was. And I didn't mean to do that. And I didn't mean to do that. Come on. Come on. Wrong way. Bingo. This is the Lakota star. This, if you turn it a little bit, you have two points on the top and two on the bottom. And this is very important for the Lakota people. And every Lakota baby receives a receiving blanket with a nine-pointed star on it. Well, by turning it a little bit, suddenly you see, well, there's the nine points coming into play here. And so instead of seven circles, there will be nine. These other two are added. Seven circles in two dimensions. In the third dimension, we create the nine circles. So suddenly, mythology of the Lakota is describing this structure. Now we'll turn to taking a look at the ancient Sumerians, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and the design of the Ark of the Great Flood, which is the story that's based, that provides the basis for Noah and his Ark in the Bible. Okay? So Utnapishtim uh, is the Noah for the Sumerians, and he builds an Ark per the request of uh, one of their gods, and there's a specific design for it, and the has built construction of the Ark, which is referred to as the preserver of life. And the specifics are that the dimensions had to be equal in width and length, and breadth, um, but in part of the story it just says width and length. Later on it says width, length, and breadth. The length, width, and height each have to measure 120 cubits. The floor space is measuring one field, which is equivalent to 14,400 cubits. The interior of the structure was divided so as to include seven floors, and each level was divided into nine sections. So academics have looked at the first requirement, dimensions equal in width, length, and breadth, and concluded that it's a cube. It's a cube, time and time again. And I looked at that and I thought, well, a sphere is equal in length and height and, and breadth, too. So if, it, if the arc is a cube, how well is it going to react in, in, a, in a flood? And here we've got an ice cube that isn't doing too well for Atnapishtim floating in the water. So does that work very well? Or is there another possibility? And I say that there is, a sphere. And that'll float very balanced if we put sufficient ballast on the bottom. It'll float just fine and we'll go through the flood and just wait for, to hit a mount and, and we'll survive and get, get off the boat and start life all over again. So let's take a look at this. We've got nine sections for each level, seven levels, and 120 cubits in each dimension. So we could have a square, we could have a sphere. Note that seven times nine is 63, so there were 63 compartments in this structure. Does that ring a bell for anybody, for any other culture? 63 comes up again, 63 out of 64 for the eye of Ra. And I suspect that there's a connection here with the eye being a sphere and these numbers being associated with the Sumerians here. That's a, just a sideline, though. But we've got dimensions equal in width and length, and the length, width, and height of each measure is 120 cubits. Well, that can represent a sphere. And so if that's the case, and we use my model for the sacred sphere geometry, we have something that looks like this, an elevation view with the top and the bottom of the arc. But that's just reaching for something, right? So in cross-section, if we cut through it, the interior of the structure was divided into seven floors. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That makes sense structurally because each one of these is coming through points that can support all the others. So you have a very stable, very strong construction. If we take a cross-section through the equator now, the floor space measured one field. 14,400 cubits. Well, if you have a sphere that's 120 by 120, 120, and you construct your seven levels as I described them, guess what the total floor area is? 14,400 cubits, square cubits. And if it, was a, if it was seven levels of a cube, you'd be way over that amount. It doesn't make sense. It can't be a cube. It fits perfectly as a sphere. And each level was divided into nine sections. So you've got some various possibilities, but the, 
the one that makes most sense to me is here's, here's one large one where you can keep the animals or your friends and relatives or the food or what have you. And then out here is where you've got ballast or the lighter goods that you've got, but in the center you're putting the heavier things in here. So you've got eight units back here and one central one is a possibility. So it makes, it makes perfect sense and numerically it fits perfectly. So I say this arc wasn't a, wasn't a cube, it was, it was a sphere. So the arc is the preserver of life, which means what? Well, certainly the earth is our preserver of life. So I say that what is being told to us here is that the ark, the preserver of life, is the earth and it is floating through space and it is taking care of us and every once in a while a flood comes through and wipes us out for, for whatever reason, but the earth will take care of us and we're able to survive and continue on. That's, that's basically what we're being told. That's the story being told uh, with the ark. Now, moving on to Egypt. A pyramid is easier to construct than a sphere, right? Again, you start with one megalithic block and then you start trying to add others and, and you can't build the thing. It just won't, won't work. But a pyramid is very stable. You just can come up to one point, it's got a broad base to it. And so, as you're probably aware, the, the height and the, the circumference of the pyramid all calculates to show that what is being represented here is a hemisphere. So the Great Pyramid represents a sphere. Uh, also, you, I'm sure you've seen these grids, and here we have Egypt and the Great Pyramid in the center here, and supposedly this is the center of the land base. Well, that's kind of a misnomer, actually. But if we look at this grid here, this doesn't look very uniform to me. I mean, there's an attempt to do it, but you could have all kinds of grids going on here and create all kinds of triangles and so forth. But at least there's an attempt, for some reason, for people to try to create find that geometry on the Earth's surface, and uh, my conclusion is there probably is, but exactly how that fits, uh, for me, life is too short to worry about. I'll let others take care of it. Our Buckminster Fuller, again, he's the inventor of the geodesic dome uh, at Disney World and so forth. Well, he designed this map of the Earth. He called it the Dymaxion, the dynamic maximum tension structure. Lo and behold, there's the nine great circles of the sacred sphere that it's all based on. This is the only evidence I've been able to find in his work where he actually uses this geometry. He doesn't apply it anywhere else, but he used it to create a map of the world. So that's, if you want a grid with triangles and so forth, there's, there's a pretty good one, but it's not gonna match up with the sacred sites on the Earth's surface necessarily. Back to Egypt. There's a canon of proportion for uh, constructing, engraving the human form uh, on various temples and so forth. So here, here we have Thoth, and he is doing his thing here, but his, there are a canon of proportions from the feet to the knees to the waist uh, and all the way on up. And the total height will equal 19 units. Okay, that was the standard of proportions. Well, here we have a fellow by the name of Hesher or Hesire. We really don't know how his name was pronounced, but I took him as a model to try this out and I fit it in and lo and behold it fits just like previous work has been done to show uh, from, the, from the hairline down to the feet that this fits. The interesting thing that I found is his leg orientation fits this uh, temple at Karnak. And I haven't seen that before. I've just seen straight up someone standing but you put this leg forward and that's fitting right in here too. So, I just put that in to show you that there was a canon of proportions for the human body on these structures. In one of the myths of ancient Egypt, Ra rode in the sky after destroying much of the human civilization and a cow trembled from the great height and spread her legs to become the four props of heaven, which are the corners of the pyramid, which in circular form looks like this. And here is the Djed pillar representing uh, Osiris. And so we have this form here representing Osiris. Robert Vall said they didn't do it constructing the Great Pyramid because they wanted an eternal tomb. They had no doubts that at all that they would eternally live. They have transmitted the power of their ideas through something that is to all intents and purposes eternal. What was it? Well, here is Petri's uh, cross-section of the Great Pyramid and we have 
uh, the King's Chamber and the Queen's Chamber and the Grand Gallery and these uh, other hallways and so forth, underground and so forth in a particular configuration. We're all pretty familiar with that. That's an east-west cross-section, um, uh, looking east or west, okay? But if you rotate and you're in the south and you look to the north, you get something like this. That's the way they line up. So here's Osiris, the Djed pillar, and then we put him next, and by gosh, what we've got is Osiris in the Great Pyramid. The canon of proportions fits perfectly. This work was done by another fellow by the name of Brown. And so what, this, what the Great Pyramid is, is no wonder that Khufu didn't have his name imprinted in, into this pyramid the only pyramid that doesn't have any names associated with it. I believe that the Great Pyramid represents humanity. That's you and me in there, and this is showing the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. And so this is the hope of rebirth, or a statement that there is this cycle of, of rebirth that all humanity will experience. And that's why there's no name put onto this. It's it was built for all of us and it's an eternal structure representing that. There may be other reasons for the Great Pyramid, but I believe that's what's going on in this orientation of the, of the structures within. And again, the geometry is fitting this sacred sphere geometry. So here's my Cloud Peak Medicine Wheel, and to the right of that is a mandala, and you can see same geometry going on in two dimensions on a, on a piece of paper, and to the right, an, another representation of that, and we have the triangles going on, which is creating the Star of David and the hexagons and so forth. And on, over here, we have this built in three-dimensional form um, as a temple, which actually has been built, for example, the Sri Maha Meru Temple in India. And if you were to look down on this, this is what you would see, this structure here. So these mandalas are temples, uh, if you're aware of that or not. So this isn't a two-dimensional structure that's just geometrical and pretty. This is a structure of the universe, the world. And it's, it, there's the, the center of the temple, which is pointing out or in, and that's creating that third dimension so that we create in miniature the universe and these sacred relationships in these temples. And it's the same geometry, obviously, as I was showing there. Now here we have the Mayans. They appear to have developed their geometry from the skin of a particular rattlesnake. And so here is the form architecturally that they created based on this uh, as representing a number of things, but in particular sacred relationships. And if you look at this, it fits perfectly into this model here again. So uh, time and again, wherever we go throughout time, we're getting the same geometry. And with respect to the, the tree of life on the sphere, the important thing is when you wrap around once, you have Keter, God, and you have Earth, that's where we are. And if you follow Kabbalah, here we are, and we can attain the status or achieve a relationship with the Creator by working our way up here. But the secret is, He's right there with us all the time. But they don't tell you that. You gotta work for it, okay? Cloud Peak Medicine Wheel, and there's the line drawing. Now I want to, now I want to do a little math for you here. We've got some parameters of one-fourth of the circumference uh, of, the, of the circle, and then A, B, C is the length of each of these, of this triangle, remember that two, three, four relationship. And this is kind of representing a uh, 30, 60, 90 triangle. So here's a 30, 60, 90 triangle where the small leg is X and the, the hypotenuse is twice that length and the long leg is square root of three X, okay? So if X is one, H is two, and the radius is square root of three. And the circumference will be two pi times the square root of, th uh, square root of three, as an example. Okay. One megalithic yard is 2.72 square feet. And we can run through and we can see that pi divided by two times the square root, three, square root of three equals one megalithic yard. The interesting thing is when you take x at different values of a foot and you run it through, you get this radius as a result of multiplying by square root of three. And you get a circumference which surprisingly turns out to be megalithic yards. 
So when x is a certain number of feet, you get the megalithic yard out on, this, on the perimeter. <clears throat> Cloud Peak Medicine Wheel, as I said, is a perfect 83 inches in diameter. That's 260.75 inches. And when you calculate through, you find that each eighth of the circle is a megalithic yard. <clears throat> Cloud Peak Medicine Wheel was built by the Native Americans a little over 200 years ago based on my analysis of the freeze-thaw action of the, of the stones that are in that medicine wheel at such a great height. Built 200 years ago. Stonehenge built 4,500 or more years ago. Both constructed using this value. The megalithic yard. How can that be? There's something fundamental going on here that we are missing today. And I don't believe that the Native Americans were all using pendulums and, the, and sighting through a window with Venus and so forth as has been proposed. That may have been used by some cultures, I don't know, but I don't believe Native Americans 200 years ago in a valley where they couldn't see Venus because you've got these mountains around it, yet they're able to come up with that particular value. So this is a worldwide phenomenon not just European. There's something fundamental that the ancients and the indigenous still know, probably, but we haven't figured out. Now a little closer to home. Stonehenge, and in this case I put the avenue ducking down this way so south is, south is up, and we have the four station stones in here. But just to show some geometries that others have come up with, sighting through, and we have the you know, perpendicular lines across through here, and you can start forming the triangles in, in through here. Ultimately, the four station stones form half of the eight points that would create an octagon through here. So, lo and behold, the sacred sphere geometry is fitting into Stonehenge perfectly, too. It's there, and the station stones are an indicator of that, if you pay attention. So and I'll have more to say on that in my next book. But that's, that's, this is the uh, monumental structure that I'm going to use to demonstrate that what I'm talking to you about today is, is, appears to be fact. <clears throat> One of those reasons is here again, Stonehenge geometry, and here we have these eight points creating the octagon and the four station stones running through, and we have the Templar cross, if you will, right in here. Well, there it is in the sacred sphere or, or poly polygonal form. So this is the same geometry going on here. And I'm not just talking circles and spheres, I'm talking the geometries with these lines coming through it. It's the same uh, octahedral geometry that this is being constructed by. And here's a perfect example of this because this is the dome at the Library of Congress uh, in Washington, D.C. This is a dome, this is you know, a, a hemisphere. We've got the same geometry going on here. Uh, that's, this is a quick slide from a paper that I've written about Stonehenge and what I believe the, the purpose is, and I'll expand on that in the book. But it certainly has to do with this geometry in the cosmic dome. Again, the Chumash and their paintings, and on the bottom left, we have a representation uh, of part of the vision of a fellow by the name of Amerigo, who um, uh, uh, Graham Hancock writes about in terms of downing ayahuasca and having visions. And what did he construct here from his vision? This geometry. How the heck did he see this in there? There's something fundamental going on, and I go back to cosmic consciousness, that there's a fundamental geometry that's built within us that connects us to the universe and everything else. And this is, this is fundamental. There's something going on here. Here's a structure that many of the geometries I'm talking about are located. Here we have the cross, we have a circle, we have this bowing out, so that's representing a spherical form, and we have two columns here. Um, the, the structure is, is replicating to some degree this sacred sphere geometry. Any guess what this structure is? It's a uh, Freemason Hall in Virginia, Minnesota. Catholic Church in Eveleth, Minnesota. And of course we get the same geometries going on here in the Vesca Pisces and, and so forth. So Christianity is filled with the same thing that all pagans are 
are utilizing to represent sacred relationships, but it, the church is using it too, they just don't realize it. And this, it can't be any more plain than that. And this is a church, I, I just drove around churches in the neighborhood and you know, I'm starting to find these things. If you start looking, you'll find them all over the place. This was the first synagogue in northern Minnesota. The interesting thing about it is there's the tree of life that was put into it. There's, oops, let me go back. Let me, come on. Malkut, earth, and there's God up on top there. It's built right in there. So maybe you go in the back door on the sphere and that's how you can connect up in there, I don't know. But. So this geometry is everywhere. Somebody knows about it. They're doing something with it. We're not realizing it. And I, I'm just, uh, just bringing it to your attention. The Maya depiction of the world, and if we look at world geometry in, in terms of the Earth and the galactic plane and so forth, you can start to see it in, uh, in the Earth structure. Nine worlds of Norse mythology, people haven't been able to figure out what the configuration is. I propose that it's a cube representing the sphere with the Earth located in the middle of it, and these are the roots of the Tree of Life uh, out to the three dimensions. But it's, you have a very similar geometry going on there. Um, this is Gobekli Tepe. This is one of the T columns or pillars, and there's, this circle was curious to me. What I did is I found that the stars um, in, uh, for December 21st, 2012, stars uh, align perfectly, or we should say these engravings align perfectly with stars, the constellations that you find in this area, and that that's, that circle represents the sun passing through the galactic plane just a few months ago, and that this structure, many, many thousands of years old, these people were pointing to this time, that, that they were following procession, calculated out, and said at some point, this is an important time. And I have a paper on the internet about that. This is the temperature, how am I doing on time, folks? Am I all right? This is, this is the, this is the universe, and the temperature of the universe uh, is plotted and, and changed to densities, density being relative to what the temperature is throughout the universe. And what has been considered for the last 100 years or so is that the shape of the universe can be modeled based on a dodecahedral space. And I would propose that with minor modification, with using the Dystiacus dodecahedron, there are two requirements in order to satisfy the astrophysicists for the shape of the universe. One, you have to take each one of these, these faces and glue them together to an opposite face, like I did here. And two, the, the numbers have to work in the model. So I say if we already have a dodecahedron as representing the the shape of the universe with a very mod mild modification and considering we're finding this geometry everywhere, run this model here because I, I suspect it's gonna be more accurate than the one that they're using today. <clears throat> one reason why I say that is in four dimensions, the shape of the universe in four dimensions is a torus with a singularity uh, right in the middle of it. And a fellow by the name of Haramine, anybody heard of him? And Rauscher have solutions to Einstein's field equations and they have, found this structure to be a torus, and you know, there's lots of gobbledygook physics going on in here. But the, in two dimensions, the geometry that's going on is this, which I've already showed you is a two-dimensional representation of the sacred sphere geometry, which in four dimensions is this. So suddenly the flower of life is coming in, and, and, and Haramine and so forth are getting excited. I think we're finding the shape of energy in the universe. And, but they're only this far. They haven't gotten to the third dimension, but I swear to you that it's going to be the sacred sphere geometry. <clears throat> One example of that is the lemniscate of Bernoulli. Again, that's a figure eight structure. This is a very important one, and Bernoulli is a very important scientist in the past. But as it turns out, this figure eight geometrically is identical to the Dystiacus dodecahedron. So, and this is important in terms of understanding what the shape of the universe is because you have hyperbolic uh, orientations here, you have spherical orientations, you have planar orientations that come out of this structure, and those are the three possible uh, characteristics for the shape of the universe, one of the hyperbolic flat or, or curved. 
and uh, which again to me points to a high probability of the shape of the universe being represented by that uh, geometric model. <clears throat> Lastly, the Higgs boson was, uh, evidence for it was found last July and you take two protons and you smash them together and see what happens and what you get out of it are two hadrons and two electrons and we have the orientations of those spinning out of here and you can see everything is forming this sort of spherical form, everything's curved and shooting out of here but the, the four particles that come out and well there's the cross. So the, the geometrical pattern of these products of smashing those protons together as an indication of one of the smallest particles of energy or waves of energy in the universe appears to be modeled by this, by this geometry. <coughs> So observe, the sacred sphere geometry has been observed by shamans across space and time, and at least they've recognized a facet, two-dimensional facet of it. It's expressed in sacred geometry, in mythology, art, architecture, and other cultural traditions around the world for thousands of years. Current astrophysical analysis strongly su suggests that the geometry expresses the probable 4D shape of the universe. And it appears to be the geometry the fundament of the fundamental particles of energy, and therefore matter, throughout space and time. So I believe that once the scientists figure out the third dimension of that uh, flower of life as representing the shape of energy throughout the universe, that we're going to see the intersection for the first time of science and the sacred. When that happens, now we're going to have unity. Uh, we'll be all coming together. The science, scientists can join us together because they've now realized something that shamans have been realizing for ten thousand, tens of thousands of years. So, and they'll lay claim to having discovered it, but we'll know better. Uh, this slide is just showing, showing that, uh, that, that geometry, again, found historically and prehistorically, if you start going back 1.5 million years ago to an appreciation of, of the sphere and these triangular forms, um, all the way through, through today, the geometry is everywhere, and it's not any specific spherical geometry. It's not a sphere sphere. I'm talking about this specific geometry with the 26 vertices and the nine great circles or the nine octagons. This is the representative that from which you can draw all of these others and all the sacred geometries you can think of and, and the ones you see on the walls here. I really appreciate these being up because um, you'll have another interpretation of what's going on rather than circles that we're talking about a spherical form that fits these, this model every time. And thank you.